Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful day of life. We thank you for the love that would not let us go and that you have poured yourself out to save us from ourselves. Lord, we ask that you would send your spirit, your Holy Spirit, to open our hearts and our minds to your word and that you would open your word to our hearts and our minds that the two would become one, that we would draw nearer and nearer to you, that we would see your great love, we would see our total our total need and our total dependence for you and our our need to learn to love each other. Father, just bless us um, as we seek to hear your voice and draw closer to you and, and to each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to read some of these verses together. Um, you know, we can split them up. We can start in chapter 3, verse 1, and, and read to, well, verse 9, I guess. We'll deal with the first couple questions. Um, before we start doing that, I want just to recognize that three times he's going to ask a question, and then, well, he's going to ask more than three questions, but three times he's going to answer the question with a God forbid phrase. You see it in verse four. You see it also in verse six, and then he's going to have a longer deliberation. Then you'll see at the end of uh, chapter three and verse 31. So he's going to ask these questions, and he's going to say, God forbid. You know, in other words, you know, that's not the way it is. So you'll see this pattern, and Paul's going to go back and forth as he as he did before. Um, so, anyways, uh, who would we? We'll start reading. We'll read the first nine verses. How's that? And then we'll talk about that. And uh, by the way, the floor is open for anybody in terms of questions or talking. So, um, I'll read the first verse, and then someone can carry on with with verse two. It says, "What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision?" much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Or what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of god what shall we say is god unrighteous who takes vengeance i speak as a man verse six god forbid for then how shall god judge the world for if the truth of god hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory why yet am i also judged as a sinner and not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil, that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Okay. So Paul is, be, is continuing his argument, and now he's going to press it uh, to the religious Jewish mind. Uh, I guess I'll we'll just deal with one question at a time, unless you want to go ahead. But so he says, "What advantage then has the, what advantage has then has a Jew?" In verse one, what's the profit of circumcision, and what's his conclusion? Much in every way. Much in every way. Why? Chiefly why? Because what? They were given the because oracles them was of the scriptures. The oracles of God. That's right. And so the word oracles there is logia. It's the same. It's the tense of the word logos, right? Hmm. So they're given the logia. They've been given the word of God. So that's, is there a benefit to being given the word of God? Amen. <laughs> Absolutely, right? That's why they're they can. That's why they have this idea that they're a, a, a guide to the blind and a cheat teacher to those who, who are foolish. You know, who, who are foolish who don't understand. But what what has become what has become the problem? Some did not believe. They weren't setting a good example. Okay. And what 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 are they not believing? What what good, what not good example are they setting? The word of God, yeah. Jesus, teaching right. those not to sin, and yet they were sinning themselves. 
teaching okay. them so, not to commit adultery, but they were committing adultery. Right. So, so, so here's what happens. They actually fall into the trap that they think that having this knowledge and having this, this extra knowledge and this extra insight actually changes their nature. Mm. They think that that makes them better than who they are. As if, as if the righteousness of God is philosophical, theological, you know, brain, in, you know, insight, information, knowledge, right? And so it can change of, your nature. The Holy Spirit has to from within. Right. And by the way, this he is one of the original. 20, he says in verse 20 of chapter 2, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. They had a form, right. but not that's a right. transformation. But not the substance. That's right. So this is where Eve fell, remember? That God promised her, her eye, that Satan promised, the serpent promised her that her eyes would be open and that she knowledge. would have this knowledge. And that the, somehow she believed this lie, that the, that the knowledge, if she had this knowledge or this insight, that that would make her a god. And we, we still, in our fallen nature, have this idea that if I know, if I have the right information, somehow that changes my changes my nature, transforms me, or makes me something other than what I was. Right? Isn't one of the things also that the Jews are always saying that a, a relation of Abraham and basing everything on that relationship and not their individual relationship to God? Yes, yeah, and that that certainly falls into it. That's part of that's part of the trap of of need information, right? Because then you start attributing the source of information to where you got it from. So you start looking back to your founding fathers, whoever that may be. And for the Jews here, that would be one of them would be Abraham, right? So so the the point here is that they've been given the oracles of God, but rather than Rather than seeing themselves by reading the word of God, seeing themselves in terms of their great need and, and their great sinfulness and, and the great need of God's mercy, they start view, somehow viewing themselves as better than other people. Privileged. Yeah. Right. As if somehow, if somehow that information gives them a foot up or something, rather than, rather than that information helping them to realize that they're they're just as bad if not worse than other people because just, if i have that information i have all that knowledge and yet i and somehow i think that i'm better than other people then i didn't listen to what the word of god said right right, right. they shouldn't have been felt they shouldn't have felt more privileged they should have felt more responsible that's right and they should have saw their seen their need to depend totally upon the righteousness of god which yeah. is what paul is, is driving at here because yeah. the idea that that any of us have any righteousness of ourselves then somehow we did not listen to the word of god right there was not a there was not a hard experience there was a hardening of the heart that's right that's right and Paul says that in other places, if I have all wisdom and all knowledge, and if I have if I have can fathom all mysteries, but have not love, then I'm you know, then I'm nothing, right? Mm. What's that? First Corinthians 14, 13, 14. Yeah. So Perfect. the idea here is knowledge puffs, you know, knowledge puffs up, but live, love builds up. So somehow they have the word of they've had the word of God, but it hasn't transformed them. Right. So they're holding it as, as information and they're putting it like feathers in their cap as if, well, I'm right about this and I'm right about this and I'm right about this. See how right I am. Well, that's not that's not the point of what God was showing them. He says that in chapter two, verse five, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, you treasure Sorry. up this resistance um, of um, what righteousness is. So, so I, I really want to linger here for just a second before we go on to uh, the next question. But, you know, the same thing happened to Christians. You know, Gnostic, Gnosticism came in to early Christianity. 
And narcissism is this idea that I have this secret wisdom, that I have this secret knowledge, and that somehow that gives me a leg up over other people, that I can read the Bible and I have this neat insight and somehow I'm in the know and other people are not in the know. And somehow that makes me one of God's favorite people and these poor other slobs, too bad for them, they're in the darkness. But, you know, maybe God will love them too, but they'll, you know, you know, so this this idea that took over took over Judaism is the same idea that took over Christianity. It's the same idea that always takes over God's people when they start relying on the neat information that they've gathered about God is that somehow that makes that that makes them better rather than realizing realizing and seeing our complete and total dependence upon God. To include the remnant church. That's right. And that, so that same danger, that same danger confronts all of us. And the more knowledge, the more insight God gives us, the more danger there is for us to think that that extra insight somehow gives us a leg up. Right. You remember, um, someone mentioned, Dan asked me before, when in Romans chapter 1, and Paul says, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the to barbarians and to the Greeks, Right. Uh, verse 14, I'm debtor to both the Greeks and the barbarians, the wise and the unwise. And, and, and the point here is, why is Paul saying he's a debtor to these people when he's so much smarter than them? He has so much more knowledge than them. He's been to the third heaven. He knows mysteries of God that he doesn't even tell other people. Uh, how is he a debtor to these poor and worthy slobs who don't know anything? Well, that's the point. Yes. Right? He's, he sees himself as a debtor to them. He doesn't see himself as better than them or above them. He sees himself as their servant because if he knows so much, then then he has a responsibility to, to not only demonstrate the righteousness, allow the love of God, the righteousness of God to be demonstrated through him, but to share that knowledge and that information so that it can help other people. So, yes. so that that greater insight makes me a debtor. It doesn't make me somebody better. It makes me more of a servant. Yes. And, and by the way, that reveals the mind of Christ, right? That's what Jesus came. Jesus had all this knowledge. He never walked around just spilt out knowledge to make make people feel better to show them how show people how smart he was. He wasn't interested. No, he was always trying to to glorify his father and to to only give light to people that would 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 save them, that would help them give them insight to see their need. Yes, not not privileged, but responsible. Like Paul, he, he was debted to them because he didn't feel privileged, but he felt responsible to make sure that they knew the love of God, make that's sure right. that they knew that they were saved by God. So that's why he says here, for what if? So what if some did not believe? Well, what's he saying? What did they not believe? Well, they didn't reason from the evidence in the word of God to see their absolute unrighteousness, their absolute unworthiness. They didn't They didn't see that. No, the more light God gave them, the more they thought that that made them better than other people. Hey, that's wrong. And they, drew the, they made these walls between them and the Gentiles. And somehow the Gentiles are these poor and worthy slobs that just are not, are not worthy you know, of us. And they made these walls of distinction, that, mm. of separation. Of course, you know, we would never have done that, right? We don't, we don't see ourselves better than those Sunday keepers. You know, you know, I mean, we have, see, this is the trap of our, of our flesh. By the way, that's what he's yeah. talking about. Yeah, amen. So if, what if some did not exercise faith? Well, they didn't exercise faith in the word of God to see their total, their total need, their total dependence upon God and, and see themselves as worse. You know, Paul sees himself as the worst of sinners. And when we come to know God, we're supposed to see ourselves as the worst of sinners. So then he says, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Well, then he says, well, God forbid, right? <laughs> Because God is the truth. God is the source of truth. And every man is a liar. By the way, it says Psalm 116 there. That every man is a liar. And then as it is written, and then he quotes Psalm 51. And what was Psalm 51? They have atonement David, prayer. David. Go ahead, James. Yeah, it was King David. Um, have mercy on me, O Lord, according to thy loving tenderness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me from my sin, and cleanse me from my iniquity, for my sin is ever before me. 
it's ever before me. And That's against right. thee, thee only have I sinned and done that which is evil in thy sight, O oh Lord. I was so born. This, this, this is the experience that knocked yeah. David off his high horse, right? Prayer when, the sin, when the sin that's in him, when what was in him came out of him, he ends up committing adultery and murder against other people. And he begins to realize that he is not what he thought he was. He begins to see himself for what he really is. Isn't that yes. amazing? Yes. So when there, we begin to see ourselves for what we really are, that's when we're actually seeing God. Amen. It's, in, a, in, it's in, a day of atonement that's, prayer. That's right. And by the way, th when, when we begin to see ourselves as we are, we recognize the, the, the absolute necessity of God's, God's atonement. I was going to say in that verse there too, it says, For if some did not believe, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Um, that's the enemy of darkness talking at the tree with Eve and it's speaking um, to that somehow God didn't create a covenant and that the covenant was not there, but it was us who broke the covenant. And it, that statement brings one all the way back to the Garden of Eden with Eve and Adam um, stating very clearly um, that no, um, uh, I can take of this tree, I can partake of this tree, um, and I will still have knowledge of good and evil. So it brings you back to that, and it really speaks about the covenant um, of uh, that existed, or that man broke the covenant, but God never broke the covenant. That's uh, right. And that's what he says in verse five, right? But if our unrighteousness, so you'll mm -hmm. notice, you'll notice that he begins to come back to this idea. See, in, in Romans one. 17 he talks about the righteousness of god that is revealed by faith and throughout romans 3 he's going to talk about the righteousness of god notice he doesn't say the righteousness of christ why doesn't he say the righteousness of jesus why is he saying the righteousness of god that's where it originates because god was indwelling jesus well, because Jesus Jesus does not come in his own righteousness. Mm. Yeah, well, Jesus least. laid down his own his righteousness. Now he now by the way, Jesus could have come in his own righteousness, but then he would not be our example, would he? Mm. No, no, Jesus doesn't come relying on his own righteousness. Jesus came and he trusted totally in his father. He trusted in the righteousness of God and he revealed the righteousness of God. Amen. And so by by so he becomes our example that we, if we follow Christ, then we we don't have any righteousness of our own. We we totally depend upon and rely upon the righteousness of God. So Jesus came to reveal the righteousness of God, not his own righteousness. Hmm. Of course, now Jesus could have revealed his own righteousness because he was, but he did not. Remember, he, Jesus said, "The works that I do, who does them?" The Father. It's the Father who does the, does the works through me or in me. Go ahead, Craig. I think it's amazing. And in, in by verse four, you know, he's in pointing to the righteousness of God and and revealing our unrighteousness. It's it's God who's being justified, and it's God who's overcoming in the judgment. <laughs> That's right. It's, God, it's not That's us. Right. It's not talking about our being justified and our being. Our overcoming. It's about him being judged and and getting the victory and being seen in the way he really is in, in this great controversy. No, that's we're right. We're supposed to be a, an empty vessel for God to shine his light through. And in many ways, Jesus made himself that for God to shine through him as an I, example to us. Because of myself, I can do nothing. That's right. Even though he That's could, right. in many ways, because he was God and he was righteous, but he chose to allow God to work through him. And, and just think how great the temptation was for Jesus to rely on his own righteousness, to reveal his own righteousness when he was put in these situations. Mm -hmm. And yet he doesn't. 
Even if it's going to cost him his life, he does not. No, he's going, to, he's going to trust in his father. I don't care if it kills me. I'm not doing it on my own. I'm going to trust in my father. Yes. And that's so, so amazing. And here, here we are. We have no righteousness to rely on. And we end up relying on ourselves <laughs> and our own wisdom. It's like, how insane are we? Yeah. And, you know, for us to experience this is so important. So we can experience that debtedness to all of those who don't understand, not feel privileged, but to go about my father's business. But we need to understand that we have to acknowledge our own sins, our transgressions against him, and that we've sinned against God. And it's his righteousness and his righteousness only that can save us. But once we realize that and experience that, now we understand more as to why we are indebted to the to the world and to share the gospel. Amen. Amen. So if our unrighteousness commends the righteousness of God, in verse 5, then what shall we say? So he's saying if our unrighteousness makes more clear, makes more manifest, makes, I guess, brighter, if you want to talk in terms of glory, the righteousness of God, then what should we say? Is God unrighteous, unrighteous who takes vengeance or takes... Or gives us over to wrath? Well, he says, well, that's the second God forbid, right? For how then would God, could God judge the world? What's the point of God's judging the world anyway? What's he trying to do? Vindicate his name in our eyes. For his name. Reveal, so reveal, I'll say, thank you. Say it the same way. Reveal his character. Reveal his righteousness to us. So that every person can then choose. Do you want to rely on your own righteousness, which, by the way, you don't have any, or you will you accept the righteousness of God, right? And then he says what he says in verse seven: For if the truth of God abounded more through, abounded through my lies unto His glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And why not, rather, as we Sanders reported, and as some affirm, we say, let us do good, let us do evil that good may come. So is Paul saying, is Paul saying that we should continue to do evil because it makes God's righteousness look all the more righteous? No. No, absolutely not. No. no, that's foolish. By the way, some are saying he's saying that. By the way, who's saying that that Paul's saying that? It's critics. Who, who would, would be saying that? That would be the Jews. Jews. It would be the it would be the Jews, right? Because sin is a transgression of the law, and they're claiming that Paul is telling people to to dismiss the law. Right. So they're claiming that Paul is telling people it's okay to sin to dismiss the law. That's what they're saying Paul is saying. But that's not what Paul is saying at all. <laughs> No, he's just... saying that you have you have the law, but you haven't seen the purpose of the law, which he's going to state here um, in verse 20, the end of verse 20. And, and, and how else how else would the covenant of enmity happen? Yes, yes. And we're going to talk about that, James, if we get there tonight, uh, the enmity in, in, that we talked about in Genesis chapter three, because there's some huge issues here that uh, are at stake. You know, so, I think that go one, ahead. something that's really important is uh, verse 3. Of course, I just put drops in my eyes and now I can't read it. Um, what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Well, yeah. You know, the faith of Jesus, that's why it's not faith in Jesus. It's the faith of Jesus. Because... We may have unbelief, but God is still faithful regardless of our unbelief. Sometimes we think we can change things because we have faith, and faith is important. But even if we lack the faith, God is still faithful. Amen. Amen. I believe so that's the that, saying. That's right. So it's the faith of Jesus. Just like verse 3, it says it's the faith of God, right? That's right. Yes. So when we so when we exercise faith, we're actually partic partaking in the faith of Jesus or the faith of God. Just okay. like when we say that uh, Christ is our righteousness, it's actually the righteousness of God. By the way, that's what he's going to say. God shows his righteousness by justifying the wicked. That is the demonstration of the righteousness of God. 
because we can't even have faith of our own. It's only the faith of Jesus that we're that we receive the faith that we can have faith. That's right. So here's where and now we're going to start getting into this little conundrum that we're you're talking about, Julia. Uh, let's look at verse 10. And he's if, going to talk about the, the, if I may, ahead. just real quick. Um, no. and as I'm reading this, what I'm pressed about by the spirit is um, the same questions are being asked. He says, where are you? What have you done? That's right. Who told you? Who told you? That's right. Where are you he getting this? Three things in these nine verses. He's he's speaking. Um, what what's going on here? What what's what's where's the light in your? Where, where, is not shining in in the darkness in you, Jim? Where are you, Jim? Who told you? And right. What have you done? Who has deceived your mind and led you so far astray? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The same question you asked Adam and Eve, that's correct, absolutely correct. Yeah. And the, the, the cool thing is here is that, that Paul is making an argument. His argument is, is, is absolutely clear that there is no other source of righteousness other than God. There is none righteous, no, not one. He's going he's gonna to quote it, I mean, from Scripture. Yeah. But there is no other source of righteousness. You absolutely have absolute no righteousness of yourself. You cannot produce any righteousness. You don't know anything. You can't see anything. You don't understand anything. You are so degraded and so so twisted by sin that you don't even know how far apart far from God you are. Amen. I think of um, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, when, when Solomon says, um, that what is crooked cannot be made straight and what is lacking cannot be counted. We, we can't even, we don't even see how far from God we are. That's just, that's how, how dark, how, how unrighteous, how sinful and deplorable we are. And the absolute, the absolute helplessness of our nature. See, this becomes an, a real issue. And we're, you know, we're going to talk about it here, but we're actually into it. So right. He says in verse 10, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understand. There's none that seek God. So again, he's he's dealing with all humanity here. This is the the human condition. They are all gone out of the way. Remember the inclusive language of Revelation in, in Romans chapter one, right? He kept using the word all, all. The same thing here. There's none and all. This is all inclusive language. So he's, he's really describing the condition of all humanity. So they're Ask all gone. Question, What's that? Ask a question. Sure. So when I was still drinking and things were getting pretty bad and I was seeking God, was that the Holy Spirit working in me? Absolutely. And I didn't even know it. Nope. Wow. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about that. He's also right showing. He's also showing that he's changed. You know, we've been at three. Uh, at three, he's he's saying, "Only what if? What if only some of them do not believe?" And now he's gone to, "What if everybody doesn't believe?" So he, he's changed his his language, if you will, from so. If there are some believers and some non-believers, does that change the God's effect? Well, of course not. And now he's saying, well, what happens if everybody does? It? Yeah, that's right. And now he's actually quoting the oracles of God, right? And if the Jews who had the oracle, oracles of God actually read the oracles of God, then they would have already known that there's none that there's none that are righteous. No, not one. There's no one who understands. There's no one that seeks God. Well, that means that's them. So how do they think that they're better than other people because of the light that they've been given through the word of God when the word of God tells them that they're that they're all they're in the same situation as everybody else? That's why he's talking about the unbelief that they don't they're not reasoning from the scriptures to see themselves as God sees them. So now he's he's actually quoting the oracles of God that prove that they that the Jews did not read the scriptures and interpret it correctly. They're hard and so, hard. So they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There's none that does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open 
sepulcher, their tongues, they, they, use, they have used deceit, the poison of asps is under their lips, their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, the way of peace they have not known, there's no fear of God before their eyes. So he actually, he describes the actual utter, utter deplorableness of the human nature, that there's no good in us whatsoever. Okay, so herein starts the debate, the discussion that takes place. If there's no, no good, no, absolutely no goodness in us, no righteousness in us, there's nothing good that's in us whatsoever, that we are so degraded and so deplorable by sin, how is it then that we can respond to God's righteousness and be saved? Through his Holy Spirit, it's always there for us. Because he, because he loved us first, and his love draws us. Okay, but now, it, we, if we, as a, in Proverbs, it says that, um, that wisdom cries out on the mountain, and mm -hmm. wisdom cries at the city gates. And he then goes on to say, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And the only way we understand and know what evil is, is if... His righteousness and light shines in our darkness, then we understand. We will understand once our heart is transformed. I mean, everybody hears the word, but not all Israel is Israel. But everybody who hears the word of God is not transformed either. But once you're transformed and allow that word to transform us, crucify the flesh, boy, then the faith will really begin to take root and grow all of us. Well, this is a question I think that we really need to t spend some time dwelling on. You know, I don't let me share some historical knowledge with you in terms of where Christianity has been. You know that there was uh, this big debate between Arminius and Calvin over these issues. Oh yeah. Now, um, this is an important important for us to understand. Many of our Christian brothers who are from the Calvinist camp. Does anybody understand what the Calvinists are saying here? No. Nope. What their conclusion was? Yeah, predestination. Yeah. Okay. And why do they come to the idea of predestination? Well, the, if, if you read that in, is it Ephesians? or Yeah, I think it's in Ephesians. Paul talks about being predestined, and uh, um, I'd have to refer to that. But Right. So why, are we, why would we have to be predestined? Well, God knows the beginning from the end. I think it's just a misinterpretation of what God's true meaning of that is. Well, that, that's, that's true. About the Calvinists, why the Calvinists think this way. That's right. And that's, so the point here is that the Calvinists believe that we are so degraded and, and corrupt by sin that, that, we, that we can do nothing. We cannot even respond. That's what he says. Like there's no one who understands. There's none that seeks God. Right. There's none righteous. Or, they've all together. They've, they've gone all the way. They've together become unprofitable. There's none that does good. No, not one. So the idea here, when Paul talked earlier about those who do good. Right. Well, the, the Calvinists will say, well, you can't do good. You, can, you can't even respond to God. You don't even understand. So mm. God has to God has to do it for you. And this is where what they say is that even the exercise of your will would be a work. That you would so, that would come something would come from you, and it all has to come from God. So Calvinists believe that humanity is so depraved and so degraded that God has to choose for us; that only God can save us. And is yeah, you see, it doesn't matter what if they're good or bad because God has already chosen them if they're going to go to eternity or not. So God, so man can't choose for himself, right? So here's so so here that's that's the Calvinist position, but but of course we we hear what they're saying, but we don't agree with that. Why? Because we do have a choice. Oh. Yeah, choose you this day whom you'll serve. You know, choose okay. life, not death. We actually read Ezekiel once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I think the Holy Spirit prompts. I think the Holy Spirit prompts us to do good things, but some of us do it and some of us don't. Some of us resist the Holy Spirit. And if you continually resist the promptings of the Holy Spirit, you'll be lost. 
Okay, well, let, let me go is, back. I've there, actually, there is, the question goes no back covenant. further than that. There is well, no that, covenant. That, there is no covenant there. There is no okay. relationship. So, so, so what I'm saying is that you, we, I think we need to go back a, a step further than, than uh, what, many of your comments are correct. But see, what happens is we agree with the Calvinists that our humanity is absolutely depraved. That there's nothing good in us. There's no righteousness in us. We don't understand. We don't see God. There's nothing in me naturally that 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 that, that goes out goes out to God, right? But see the problem. But see, this is what happened. We, we're back to to, to Genesis chapter three, James, because when God when God came and talked to Adam and Eve, what did He say? Hmm. What did He say to Eve? Put in the TV between. Ah, so so the Calvinists are correct. Correct. We cannot respond to God. We don't see God. We don't understand. There's nothing in me that says, oh, I need God. No, no, no. No, God has to act. But God did act. And God said, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, Satan, and the woman. So what is enmity? Yeah. It's a it's a space. It, it's it's about he's he's giving us our will. He's allowing us to enter into a covenant uh, with ah. him, coercion. So here in lies. See, Arminius used the word uh, pre pre evident grace. The idea that God God steps in and dispenses grace to us, so that we can respond. Because otherwise, we would not be able to respond. And by the way, that's true. Without so the, the enmity, point is, we would have no choice. The, the without enmity, we that's right. So enmity is this pre pre evident grace. This, God steps in and pours grace upon us. So he puts enmity between us and Satan, and evil, so that there's a resistance factor. There's something. There's He gives us our will back, basically, so that we can choose. And then, so God's grace is is working. He's striving on our hearts. The Holy Spirit is actually striving with every fallen human person because there's enmity that has been placed there, yeah. right? So this is the answer that we have to the Calvinists and their position. By the way, we're going to run into some of the Calvinism here and later in the book of Romans again when this is taken. So Arminius agreed with Calvin about the state of humanity, but he... But he talked about God's intervention that restores our will and our mind enough to make a choice. Yeah. And see, so that's that's very very important. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk to someone who's a Calvinist, you talk you talk about the right, you, the right action of your will. They'll look at you. Well, that's that's works. You're, that's being saved by works because <laughs> that's coming from you. So they actually believe that you exercising your will is a work. But we know that exercising our will is a, is a necessary ne a necessary response to God's grace to receive the benefits of His atonement. Yes, right. I think steps to Christ says that even forgiveness or um, repentance is a gift. Is a gift. That's right. So that's, that's what right. we're talking about here. That's right. Yeah. That's why no. There's everything we do. Everything that we do is to give glory to God. Yeah. That, that, that if there's something good in me, it didn't come from me. It came from God. Amen. And, the, and, and God's, my ability to respond to God comes from God. Yeah. So even my response to God is, is giving, giving glory to God. It reveals God, God's glory. It reveals God's love. It reveals God's mercy. It reveals God's de desperate desperate attempt to save lost people from themselves yes. what a beautiful beautiful picture of god <clears throat> amen. Wow. amen and this is where it comes from this is see this is important to paul paul has to paint a picture that's so so absolutely dark that you that you will totally give up on any idea that you have some righteousness of your own, or you're ever you're ever going to get to some point in your life that you're going to produce some righteousness. That's never going to happen, never. Throughout eternity, you you will there is no righteousness in you. You will never produce any righteousness. The Amen. only righteousness that you will ever be in contact with is the righteousness of God. And throughout Amen. eternity, we will be glorifying God and praising him for his righteousness. Amen. 
And he's going to yeah. reveal his righteousness and his gifts and his beauty and his love and his wisdom and his kindness and all these different attributes through us. But we will never take glory to ourselves because it oh. doesn't come from me. All the people said amen. All the people oh, said amen. That brings up another that brings up another question. So how is it with the angels? They fell. That's so right. It's the same with got... all creation. That's the whole point, isn't it? Well, that's that all creation reveals the glory of the creator. Yeah. And you and 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 you know what? Some beings didn't have to fall to figure it out. Lucky them. <laughs> <clears throat> no, no, no. <laughs> it's interesting. No, no, no. They have from, the same choice to make that we have, right? From are they going to trust in their own righteousness? Or are they going <laughs> to realize that all, all things come from God? Yeah. It's interesting. That's what, that's what Satan was saying, wasn't it? That they didn't need law. He was saying that they had their own righteousness, wasn't that's right. he? That's exactly right. Now we're at the heart of the issue, aren't we? Yeah, he between... was telling them they could do without, do without God. Well, that's interesting. Go ahead, Craig. Between verses ten and eighteen, when Paul is describing our true condition, I, I count fourteen different ways he describes it. So kind of two, <laughs> two, two sevens, like a double perfection of unrighteousness. <laughs> <laughs> See, if we let that sink in, if that actually takes hold of us, then humility is not a, an attribute that I have to strive to get. It's, yeah. it's inherent in my fallenness. Yes. And this argument, you know, there's going to be a discussion in heaven, you know. And everybody's going to be saying they're the worst sinner and they're the least one that's worthy of salvation. And everybody else is going to be saying, no, it's not. You're not the worst one. It's me. Yeah. And everybody's going to think it's them. The only way that you decrease is he must increase. Amen. Amen. Paul has a pretty good handle on the title, though, doesn't he, of uh, the worst? <laughs> Jesus. But even Paul needed a thorn in his side at times. If that doesn't... If that doesn't melt your heart, change, transform your mind, what God is trying to desperately do. Amen. You know, Mrs. White in Steps of Christ, she says, the love of God for a world that did not love him. She says the thought, the thought, that thought has a subduing, a subduing effect upon the power of your mind, a transforming effect on your on your on your will, on your soul. The contemplating of the love of God for, for a world that doesn't love him. You realize that of yourself, there's no love for God in you? That we are so selfish and so twisted and so depraved that if God did not intervene, what, what would we be doing? And when we look at all these crazy people in the world doing all these crazy things, excuse me, that's me. Yeah, That's me without God intervening. Yes. I would do be doing the same thing. There am I, except for the grace of God. That's just people think. Awesome. People think sometimes they see somebody do something and they say, "I'd never do that," but they forget we all came from Adam and Eve. We all have the same fallen nature. <laughs> right, and there's and two words that the human being should never speak: always <laughs> and never. <laughs> oh, I just did that, didn't I? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, th those, those, the, the way I said it to my students, those are the words we use, we say when we're not thinking. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, for, for him to be able to um, maintain that clarity in his thought when he came in the midst of Babylon must have been very, very. A, a major trial for him to enter into Babylon. Um, it, it, I can imagine what it was like. And yet he remained clear, true uh, to his father all the while. We see the power of the cross to, to change our perspective. I mean, before the cross, how many times did it tell us 
how they were disputing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. And after the cross, they're, they're disputing about who is the greatest sinner in the kingdom. It's me. <laughs> right. I'm the greatest sinner. No, I'm the greatest sinner. <laughs> Total reversal of perspectives. And, and the difficult thing for us in our walk with God is that the, the closer I come to God, the more despicable I see myself to be. Amen. And then the problem is, is that my, my, my mind and my emotions come over and I have these expectations that the more I know God, the more righteous I'll be and the more, the more like Jesus I'll be and the more, more, you know, all that stuff. And it's like, and it's totally the opposite. The more, the closer I come to God, the more I see myself as he sees me and the more I realize what he's done to save me and, and, how I long for that old person to really be gone. You long for that day when this when this corruption will put on incorruption and this mortality will put on immortality. That 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 that, that nasty fallen creature that 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 dwells in me that I have to wrestle with every day. That that person will be dead and gone. You know that's the day that we long for, and that's something that we that we 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 never lose sight of this side of that of that time. And when we lose sight of it and we start thinking that we're better or that we're smarter or that we're wiser or that we're more righteous or that we're right in other people, as soon as we take that position that we have, then we have not, we have lost sight of the reality of our condition and, and of God's, God's amazing grace, amazing salvation for us. Well, I think of the text for all have sinned and yet all are justified in Christ. <clears throat> Yeah. You become chief of all sinners. How much more? How much more? How much more is the gift? Amen. The Amen. Amen. By the way, that's the beauty of verse 21. The, the two first two words of verse 21, right? Because yeah. he finishes the thought in verse 19 and 20 about our condition. And then he says the two words in verse 21. <laughs> this was your condition, but now... <laughs> <laughs> but now what? <laughs> but now the righteousness of God. <laughs> but now the right. So after after you see yourself, your total depravity. After you see how fallen and how empty and hopeless and and in darkness and no understanding and nothing good. When you begin to see that, but now <laughs> the righteousness of God. Yes. See, that's what we need to talk about: the righteousness of God. Now the righteousness of God has been revealed. The righteousness without the law is manifest. Amen. And he's going to keep talking about the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God. He's going to keep saying about the righteousness of God. Nowhere in there is he talking about his own righteousness. <laughs> but anyway, I jumped ahead. Let's look at verse 19 and 20 before we get to verse 21. <laughs> so now we know... Now we know, seeing our total depravity, now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. And who's under the law? Well, the very next phrase, that every mouth may be stopped. Yeah. And all the world becomes guilty before God. So when we, if see, we don't see when ourselves we see, as a sinner, we don't need a savior. And if we see ourselves as we are, then, we'll, then we would stop trying to decree reality and accept the author of reality. That we would stop saying words that mean nothing and start looking to him who is the word, the divine logos, who is everything, right? That's why he says, verse 20, his conclusion, therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. How are you, who there's no good in you, produce anything good? Didn't Jesus talk about a good tree and a bad tree? Didn't he say something about a good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit? And in case we didn't get it, then he goes on to say, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit and a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. So how many of us have produced bad fruit? That means we're what? Mm -hmm. A bad tree. And can a bad tree make itself a good tree? 
There's, no. only, there's only one tree. <laughs> and the leopard yeah. changes spots. Yes. Mm. Yes. So therefore, this is where he puts the put the puts to bed this whole idea that anything that you do or say or know or think or understand has anything to do with you, uh, your righteousness, your justification, your salvation before God. No, all these things are benefits of God's salvation, not something that you're doing for your salvation. So therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Mm. Now the but now. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is my favorite part almost, because I love that but now. Sometimes I just start crying when I read that but now. <laughs> but now the righteousness of God without the law is made manifest. Praise God. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Why? Who, who the, what's the law and the prophets? Um, the word. The oracle. That's right. The logia. The, 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 the oracles of God he's talking about. The righteousness the of God is being made, manifest by the, the, the word of God. The law and the prophets. The same word of God that revealed my unrighteousness reveals his righteousness. That's what he says, verse 20. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that exercise faith. For there is no difference. Why in verse 21 does it say the righteousness of God without the law? Because, because without the law, he, he's referring to the idea of the deeds of the law that the Jews have. That they, if they keep the law, that God will see them as justified or righteous. This is why they're depending on this idea of circumcision, right? That if they're circumcised and they're keeping the law, that means that they're just, they're, they can be made just by God. Are you with me? So that's why he says in verse 20, therefore, by, by the deeds of the law, my, my attempt to keep the law is somehow justifies me before God. He's saying, no, absolutely not. It, it seems here as paul's talking through uh chapter three that um speaking to the jews they're still at the tree of good and evil and they're still eating from it yes they're still relying on some other source of righteousness other than god that's right by the way through throughout that's a, a good point craig throughout the book of romans you need to pay attention when he uses the word law because he's he's at times he's referring to different laws. Right. Where's the so law of sin and death? That's sometimes right. the, it's the law of sin and death, and sometimes it's the moral law. That's right. So sometimes it's God's law, sometimes it's the, the law of sin, sometimes <laughs> it's the it's the it's the ceremonial law. That's right. right. That's right. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It set me free from the law of sin and death, right? That's Romans 8. That's that's right. So the so here when he's talking about the the, the righteousness of God without the law, he's referring back to what he says in verse twenty: the deeds of the law, the idea that if I keep the deeds of the law, if I'm circumcised, and then that means that I'm justified before God. He says, "Well, that's a bunch of foolishness." So it's witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's witnessed by the word of God, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. There is no difference. By the way, there that verse there flies out the window dispensationalism. Sorry, we talked about that, right? Dispensational belief teaches what? Mm. That there's different gospels at different ages. So some people are sa were saved by the law, and some people are saved by works, and some people are saved by no, 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 no. And that's no, he says here. That the righteousness of God is by faith in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all. There's no difference. So there is not, there's not a different gospel at different times. That's not true. There's only one gospel. There's only one source of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And there's only one way, one truth, one life that leads me to that source of righteousness. That's so, why it's the everlasting gospel. It's, it's everlasting. Eternal gospel. It's the That's past, right. present, and future. That's right. Mm -hmm. And everything in between the eternal gospel see so 
by the way, this is why people wrestle with Romans because Paul makes these statements, but they're so profound when you when you start taking them, taking the concepts that he's sharing, and you start you start reasoning them reasoning them through the process. You begin to realize how far reaching the, the statements that he's making are here. They have profound theological con uh, consequences. So in verse twenty three, he reminds us there's no difference for. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, all have sinned and we cannot, we, we cannot reveal, we cannot understand, we cannot see, we cannot reflect the glory, the character of God. But we are being, we are being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Who God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So this, this process of our salvation that he's describing in verses 24 and 25. Who is doing all this? God. God is. Being justified freely by his grace. To the redemption that is in Christ. Whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. You know that word propitiation. Mm -hmm. You know what that word means, right? This is, um, it's actually very interesting. This is one of the words, at the actual word is for the mercy seat. It actually describes the mercy seat. So God set forth to be a mercy seat. Back to Craig's atonement. The, the, the atonement that is made at the mercy seat is the essence of our salvation, right? And that's why he actually uses the word mercy seat here. God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. So he bears our death so we can partake of his life. He bore our depravity so we could so that we could partake of his righteousness. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of the patience of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. So he's talked about the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God, his righteousness, which is God, his righteousness again, which is God. That he might be just and the justifier of him that believes in Christ. So the righteousness of God is his ability to justify the ungodly, the unsinner, the sinner, and through his grace to save them from their sin and to restore them to himself. That's he the shall, righteousness of God. He shall, shall see the travail of his soul. Satisfied. Yes. For he has justified many. By his righteousness. Amen. And verse 27 it answers the, the, the question about which law he's talking about there. Right again, Craig, because he goes back to it. In verse 27. Where is boasting then? Well, it's excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. So therefore, we conclude that a man is just by faith without the deeds of the law so we, again he goes back to the deeds of the law the same phrase that he used in verse 20 and I bet if we look there's be a chiasm there because we goes, he goes back to the deeds of the law is he a God of the God of the Jews only is he not the God of the Gentiles yes he's the God of the Gentiles also seeing that it is one God or God is one back to the Shema which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith do we then make void the law of God through faith? The law through faith? Well, that's the third God forbid, right? Uh, yeah. No, no, we are we actually established God's law. So God's grace to save us, he gave us the law to show us how lost we are and to show us his righteousness. So that we would we would de depend on His righteousness for our for our salvation for our redemption, and we saw the law as a list of things to do. That if we did them and kept them, then that we would have the right to be to earn to earn salvation, which is impossible. 
So when Christ comes and he reveals the righteousness of God, he also reveals to us our total unrighteousness. And then he makes the, the law that brings me, as he says, the law, the law is, gives us the knowledge of sin and then brings me to, to see my great need for Christ, his righteousness. So you cannot separate law and grace here. That's the point that I'm getting at. You cannot say that we're saved by grace, therefore there's no need of the law. No, there, you would not see your need for grace unless there's the law. And once you realize the law, then you see your absolute dependency on grace. So the two, the two concepts have to come, they're, they're, they come together. You can't separate one from the other. If I believe that salvation is by keeping the law and I, and I, and I, and I minimize grace, then I've just become a legalist. But if I say that salvation is by grace and I don't need the law, then I become this non-person that's not, not understanding anything. Because the grace, grace and law can only be understood when they're seen to de together. Does that make sense? Well, that's the evidence. When the light comes into darkness and reveals that, that's evidence which we can now reason logically that it is his righteousness and faith in his righteousness that we then can believe, you know, That's right. he is our salvation. We, we, we can use that as evidence to reason and have faith as you've shared in Romans 1. That's right. And, and the beautiful thing that God does when we begin to respond to his grace as he begins to, to, to restore our mind and to restore our will so that we can see ourselves as he sees us and to know ourselves as he knows us. And the more we see ourselves and the more we know ourselves, the more we, we, we come, we should come to depend and rely upon God as a source of our righteousness and, yeah. and his savior Christ, his, his son Christ as our savior. And that alone is our salvation. Mm -hmm. Amen. And anything that God does through us, anything that God teaches us or shows us or, or does through us is, is, is glory to God. There's, there's not, it's not me. Well, and the reason the transformation is there is because before conversion, we don't have the Holy Spirit. We're not having true peace. We're not having true joy. We're devoid of those things. You know, we're, we're having joy in worldly things, but it's just temporary and then it's gone. But with Christ, we're filled with something totally different. That's right. Well, that's verse 16 and 17, isn't it, Julia? Of chapter 3, right? He says, destruction and misery are in their ways, the way of peace they have not known. See, those... We Those see the third angels' this planet who don't, the third angels who don't have no peace day nor night who worship right. the beast. That's right. That's right. And by the way, that's so significant, right? Because they have no peace. They have no rest day or night. They have no peace because they've rejected the righteousness of God and they've gone about to, to establish their own righteousness. Well, that's miserable. Mm -hmm. we, we, can only we can only experience... <laughs> That joy and gladness when our bones are breaking, broken, as it says in Isaiah, that we That's can experience right. the joys. But we have to be, our bones have to be, let, let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Let, Psalm rejoice. 51. Yes, let us rejoice. That's Psalm 51. Yes, yes. That's right. Yeah. Next time you're up in front street preaching, Sabbath morning. Look at all the happy faces in front of you. <laughs> Have you ever stood up front and, and looked at people's faces? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's looked like someone beat them with a bat to get them to church. They're, it's like they're all upset. And then you, you try to share the good news of the gospel. And you, most of the time, if you don't say anything, you don't get an amen or they won't even smile. It's like, well... <laughs> When you see the, the, the what God has done for us, how can you not smile? How can you not rejoice? Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, unfortunately, anyway. a lot of people on the platform are the same way. 
<laughs> we, we do not. That's right. We do not present that message with a joy in our hearts, uh, with animation. There's, We're just there's that, none I'm right. There's no, not one, is there, Dan? Yeah, yeah. I hear you. Hey, Dan. I'm glad I didn't say that. <laughs> well, I did. I, I, it's it's just a very good thing that the. Uh, the Lord gave that Holy Spirit that uh, no matter which side of the line you're on, that Holy Spirit is there working and um, waiting for you to understand what's right and understanding Amen. the truth. Um, can, can you imagine if we were devoid of the Holy Spirit that we, if we had to rely on ourselves to come to God, it wouldn't happen. Right. Yeah. We'd be having too much fun. You said it, Pastor, when you said when, when you see the goodness of God, then then you have to be joyful. But most people just don't see it. That's why they're so glum and solemn. Mm. Yeah, you know, somehow Satan distracts our attention That's and it. gets us to focus on the little <clears throat> troubles or stumbles or or whatever the troubles that we face, and and he and he gets us to to not look at the beauty and the glory and the of, of god and and so amazing the, um, this is the the importance of the sabbath right to just yeah. stop and put all that other mess away and to behold the beauty of god and, and to see him his fingerprints in creation or or how he's working in other people's lives or whatever he's doing and, th and that is supposed to return our minds back to him and and prepare us to to go through the week and and face the life in this fallen planet, but, but always to keep the righteousness of God and his beauty and his love and his glory and his mercy, his kindness, his compassion, his, his patience, his goodness, and all these beautiful attributes of God to, to keep them in front of our, our our eyes so that we don't get swept back into the darkness that he's trying to drag us out of. That's or should I say only, drag out of us? <laughs> that's the only place to have any safety, Pastor, because Amen. the sanctuary is just that just exactly what it says it's a sanctuary it's a safe place and the way to get into the sanctuary is to enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving and as soon as we're not in praise of others or ourselves, or we're being negative we're not in the sanctuary i'm sorry we're not we're out well we're the roaring lion is seeking to devour us okay and so we're, and we're and if we're in that state then we're not seeing god are we no so if when you see the righteousness of God, how can you and then he's making it freely available to, to save us? How can you how can you be caught up with the with the with the stumblings and fumblings of this world? And, 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 just, to, at, and just to be sure that sanctuary is not a building or it's not a place of worship. That's right. It's a state of mind, really. I mean, it's praise is we can have it anywhere at any time. And the cross is just being understanding humility and knowing our true condition. You know, I mean, you look at the steps to the sanctuary, each one is very practical and relevant to our everyday life. So, Pastor, what we need to do is take a photograph of everyone here and see who's smiling as we're studying <laughs> his word com compared to who, you know. Honestly, I've been sitting here deadpan, you know, and it's such we, a good news. We, we, we need to remember, though, there was, for a whole hour, there was silence, and there's a place for silence mm -hmm. in the worship. Sure. There's a place for deep That's silence. Right. But silence doesn't have to be glum. Silence is not glum. Exactly. Well, what we what, what we should start to desire is that that the righteousness of God would be made manifest, and that God will be glorified, and and no matter what we do, and no matter what we say, and and really what what we we talk about church, what should happen is that if we have if there's a group of growers that become the main part of the church, which is what normally happens, then the the weakest link, the the the, fur, the person person furthest from God becomes the focus of 
of, of that service to what can we do to be a blessing to that person, to help them see the glory of God, to help them re to see the, what God's great love for them. I mean, if you if you have a service and you have a total stranger walk in the room, then the whole, everybody in the, that, that's there that knows what's going on should be willing to, to change whatever has to happen so that that person receives a blessing. That person sees the righteousness of God, sees the love of God. And 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 therein lies a living a living witness where the God can the Holy Spirit can move our hearts and minds to throw away our whole agenda and just do whatever God tells us or wherever God leads us. Hmm. And I would long for that. I'm you know I I think of Paul's conversation in Corinthians. He says you know if you you know we talked about speaking in tongues. He says well if you walk in if you if you as an unbeliever walk in this group then you 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 would be made manifest you say oh god is really among you in other words the idea is this unbeliever walks in with all these believers and all these believers just stop what they're doing and focus on this unbeliever and they minister to him whatever his needs are it isn't about them anymore it's about this person and this person says wow god's really among you mm. see the see the, the you're reading the book of acts you know when, when people were afraid to go to, to fellowship with the believers in the book of Acts because the the people in the books of book of Acts were were not interested in playing church they wanted to know God and they wanted to they wanted to, to, to behold the glory and the righteousness of God and they and they were not afraid to talk about the darkness or the sin that was in them that they that that showed them their need for the righteousness of God. And they were they were interested in others. When someone walked in the door, they were they were reaching out to them to try to help them to see their need for God and to see the beauty of God at the same time. There, therein lies a church service that we have never we have never witnessed. Um, I pray someday when the latter rains poured out, we will witness it, and it will be so powerful it would Amen. convert people. I mean, that's what converted Saul to become Paul when he saw it in Stephen. Yeah, I'm. I would encourage you to spend some time this this one section from Romans one eighteen all the way here to Romans three, um, verse twenty. Paul Paul is is laying down an argument. He's laying down the reality of the fallenness and depravity of our of our human condition to show us our desperate need. For the righteousness of God as the only source of our salvation, as the only only path to restoration to life. And uh, if we could, what did Jesus say? He who has for, been forgiven much loves much, but he that's been forgiven little loves little. And if we find ourselves only loving God a little bit and rejoicing God only a little bit, it's because we don't realize how far He has He has gone to save us.